get caught in the flames of a nasty real estate closing. Did you know that in Florida, the consumer has the choice to pick your title company? So why not choose? And don't let someone else choose your fate. As a former firefighter and best-selling author, Kevin Thatcher of Independence Title will be your lifeline for your next real estate transaction. Kevin founded Independence Title in 2003 on the premise of going in the deal together and leaving the deal together, leaving no one behind. You have a choice, so choose wisely. Call Kevin today before it's too late. 754-200-3883 or visit TitleRate.com. That's 754-200-3883. Or titlerake.com. And now, welcome to the show. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another real estate podcast. My name is Kevin Thatcher, the founder and CEO, that's right, Chief Everything Officer here at Independence Title. And I get so pumped up listening to that music, that intro. It just, it gets me going. And uh, I love when we have good guests on today. Today, we have another interesting guest, my buddy, Hakeem Lakdar, who is a executive leadership coach. You may be asking yourself, what's an executive leadership coach? I promise you, we will get to that. Hakeem, my friend, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, man. That intro was great. I have that in my headphones, in my ears, got me all pumped up. I was like, oh, this could go another minute. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right. So let's always start off how I like to start off every show. Obviously, we welcome you to our show today. It's a real estate podcast, but we always know that real estate agents, sometimes they're working full time jobs, maybe somewhere else doing it part time or they want some leadership skills in their business. Maybe they're building their own business of agents. They have some employees who will get into that. Uh, I'll ask you a couple of questions, but tell the viewers just here a little bit about yourself so they know a little bit about who Hakeem is. Yeah, thank you so much. So first and foremost, I'm a husband and father of six-year-old twin boys, um, a South Florida native, though I moved around and bounced around and worked in various places in the U.S. and abroad. Um, I've worked in a legal profession as a training and development guy for a long time, but always with an element of coaching to it. And uh, when we had the boys up in Boston, we decided to move back to South Florida, and I've been back in South Florida the last six, almost seven years now. Awesome. So we had last week, I know you saw the episode, we had uh, Joel Gandara on, uh, who's, uh, you know, a friend of both of ours. You know, he does some type of coaching and, and we're in some networking groups with coaches. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, because it's not just, you're not a business coach. You call yourself an executive leadership coach. What's yeah. the difference between that and maybe some other types of, of coaches that are out there? Yeah, it's a great question. And I get that question a lot. And I think, you know, to address the first one of business coach, people hear business and they think it's sort of all encompassing. But I really think of business coaches as more of more as consultants. They're really thinking about like the dollars and cents of the business, the systems and operations that they can improve within a business that improve efficiency and ultimately the bottom line. Whereas I am much more focused on the individual. So their self leadership and their leadership of others. Okay. So, so if you're coaching someone, what does the ideal person look like? You know, we say executive leadership. So who, who's the executive that you're working with? Yeah. So it's, I think the executive can be an executive, you know, specifically an executive C-suite level employee or professional, but they can also be someone who's aspiring to get to that level, or there's someone who's maybe middle management and, you know, trying to create an executive president by, you know, in the way that they lead themselves or they lead their team. And I think that's who I, I sort of aspire to work with. It's these high achieving, high performing, highly ambitious professionals. For a long time, Kevin, I think people really thought about coaching as like a somewhat punitive thing where they were saying, look, you're not performing well. We're going to put you on a performance improvement plan. We're going to set you up with a coach. And if we don't see an improvement in six months, you're out of here. Versus now companies are saying, we're not going to invest in a coach for you if we don't see you as someone that we want to really retain or invest in. So the investment now in coaches is for the people who are actually showing promise. The talented people within an organization where they say, we see this person as valuable. We don't want them to leave. And we want to invest in a coach to help them level up. 
Okay, awesome. And I know a lot of the, you know, they're hearing C-suite executives. So for the viewers out there that or, or listeners to the podcast, uh, we normally refer to that as an entrepreneur. So it may not be the entrepreneur themselves. We mm -hmm. call that an entrepreneur, someone who is an employee of the company, but they, they treat the company as if it's their company. Um, so these are your C-suite executives that that um, Hakeem coaches and, and helps excel to obviously increase the bottom line and, and make the businesses better. Um, but these could be real estate agents, right? That maybe they're working on a team. They wanna know how can the team work better together? Um, how would you relate that to, to someone that is in the real estate game? Because obviously there's a lot of people listening to this, but you know my, my network is, is real estate investors and agents, uh, but someone, let's say they work on a team of, of five agents. What, what could you help them with? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, and I don't I don't want the misconception to be that I'm I'm specifically working with and exclude anyone other than C-suite executives. Those are those are my sort of common clientele based on what I've done in my profession. And and those are the level of professionals I've worked with, you know, in the years prior in my various institutions. So I, those are the ones I have exposure and familiarity with. But I love coaching highly ambitious, highly entrepreneurial, intrapreneurial type professionals. And real estate agents are often those types of professionals. They're they're you know highly intelligent. They're very ambitious and driven um, individuals. They see opportunity constantly, and they want to make something of it. They're inclusive and collaborative. They've got great communication skills. So a coaching relationship with real estate agents is actually uh, a lot of fun. I mean, not only is it productive and powerful, but it can be a lot of fun. So I think when you think about real estate agents. One of the things that I really focus on in my coaching is self-leadership. And I think so little has been focused on self-leadership because when people hear leadership, they immediately think of managers, bosses, supervisors. And I quickly distinguish between what it means to be a manager or a boss or a supervisor and what it means to be a leader, leader of oneself and a leader of others. And I think that as real estate agents, you, you know, you know better than anybody, but there is a, you know, a, a high high need and significance for discipline, commitment, organization, all of those things that are so crucial to self-leadership are then applied, once you apply them to yourself effectively, they're then applied to a team. So you gotta model that by doing it, and then you can start thinking about how you apply it to a team. All right, so let's say, I mean, you know, here we talk a little bit uh, enough about you, let's make it more about them now. Because uh, we always love to give, you know, nuggets. I would like to do the general, uh, you know, yeah. the, the overview of who you are and, and what you do and how you can help them. So let's talk about some challenges. What are what are some challenges you're seeing? You know, maybe pick one or two challenges that, that these high level executives have, whether it's some of the stuff you talked about. Maybe it's being consistent. Uh, maybe it's discipline. Maybe it's organizational stuff. How, how do you help them? Like, let's give some tidbits to someone if, if you were coaching me on, on a problem. Yeah, I think one of the things that comes up a lot, and and it it's sort of maybe counterintuitive, but all the things that you could list as potential blind spots or you know areas of opportunity for growth for leaders, are are never are never uncovered before we first attack self awareness, and self awareness is huge. I think self awareness for leaders there's a you know sort of this misconception that once you've reached a certain level, they've learned everything there is to know. And, you know, I don't need to hear it from the rest of you. And all of a sudden you realize that you sort of turned off this switch about learning and being receptive and open to new ideas. And you're just kind of using what's worked for so long. And when you get into that, you know, into that pattern, you really stop the expansion that you have and that you're sort of obligated to create for yourself and those you lead um, as a leader. So I think that Self-awareness is one piece where I, I focus on immediately. If I notice that a client is struggling with self-awareness to be open and honest with themselves and then with me as their coach about where their pitfalls are, where their struggles are, where some of their limiting beliefs might be, that's what I go after first. Because without that, we're never going to be able to uncover anything else. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about... Um... You know, I want to hire you, right? So someone mm -hmm. wants to reach out to you and they're just having a really big problem in their business. Maybe they're losing money. Maybe, you know, they can't afford to pay their bills. They're, they're, they're obviously struggling. They have money, but they see it's, it's declining. Um, mm -hmm. But I think as an entrepreneur, one of the biggest things that I see, uh, which is why 
I'm in so many of these high level masterminds and I'm in the brotherhood because we feel like it's instant camaraderie that, that you feel like you can be vulnerable and, and get yourself going. But do you find that people have a hard time when they're calling a coach? Like, how do you build that trust level with them so, so they feel comfortable, obviously, sharing to you their finances and their problems and their struggles? Like, I'm sure that must be a challenge for you. It is. It is. It's a challenge for all of us. I mean, I think we've all heard the expression, we do business with people that we know, like, and trust. And that takes time. And I think one of the skills that I bring to the table as a coach and something that I've developed over you know, years of working, especially in the legal profession as a non-lawyer, often the most junior person in the room at high institutions was creating sort of a, a, a level of trust and, and safety and comfort and credibility that reassures whoever I'm speaking to, whether they're a client or they're a colleague or they're a direct report, whoever it might be, that, that this is a safe place and that my intentions are all coming from a place of wanting to serve you, wanting to help. So I have no personal agenda here, except to be as helpful to you as possible. And if I can convey that within the first five, 10 minutes of meeting with somebody, whether it's a new client call, a prospective client call, or a brand new client we're diving in, you know, session one, that sets the tone for how we can kind of then ease into some of these more challenging topics. And I think you're right. I mean, I think that especially people at a certain professional level, they can hold things pretty close to the vest. You know, they don't, they don't really want to divulge all this stuff and they're thinking, what's the value? But once you explain to them that our whole purpose here is just to kind of put it all out on the table. I mean, I tell my clients this all the time. Nothing's off the table. We can talk about anything. We are talking about things in a professional context, but I also fully appreciate and encourage when my clients share some bits of their outside life with me that could be affecting their work or where their work is affecting their outside life and it becomes this vicious cycle. So once they see that there's a, there's a, you know, sort of a connection and correlation between some of these things that they may not feel absolutely comfortable sharing, but also if they do, they can have these breakthroughs and these, you know, aha moments and light bulb moments where they can start to understand themselves and their situation a bit better. They actually, they, they, they lean in and, that's, and it can be ended up, uh, end up being a productive conversation. Awesome. Yeah. I, I mean, I know I, I go pretty deep very uh, often when I'm meeting with someone that um, I feel comfortable with, uh, you know, someone asked me the other day, like, how do you pick and choose? I'm like, well, I pick and choose my friends wisely. Um, I know I've posted about that on social media a lot, but like I pick my people close because I know I like to go deep in the challenges that I'm having mm. and explore what I'm going through and how I'm going through. There have been clients I've sat with where I'm like, you know, you're looking to hire somebody like I don't do coaching. But it's like, I'll sit with a real estate agent and I'm like, here's my tax return. Like, I'll show you how much money I make. I'll show you what I like. I have no problem. Like, I'm an open book because I want you to feel comfortable that if you're going to work with me, you understand that, like, I've struggled. Like, I've been through these struggles before and some of these challenges. So, you know, again, it's very, very, uh, very, very difficult thing, I think, for entrepreneurs um, to do. So it's great that that you really understand the, the challenges that they will have with opening up and you have tools in place to be able to get them where they need to be for those that may be listening that are just like, you know what, I really know I need a coach, but I just don't feel comfortable just calling some random coach. I want to make sure I feel comfortable. So then it's almost like you're wasting the first two or three sessions. It's like you go to a therapist, yeah. you know, you're wasting two or three sessions, just getting to the, the nuts and bolts of the problem because that rapport has to be built. So the fact that uh, you're, conscious about it um and you have tools in place is is, is great. very very um, and i think you know the other thing too Kim, is that everything that we talk about in our coaching sessions is absolutely confidential and i think that eases people's minds um dramatically i mean when they walk in this is not stuff i'm posting on social media this is not stuff i'm sharing with other clients this is a one-on-one -on -one session this is tailor-made to you and whatever your needs are so I am fully present and when they feel that presence and I encourage anybody who's going out there looking for a coach to have, I mean, most coaches will give you the opportunity to sit and talk with them, have one, two, multiple free consultations to get a feel for the fit and that trust, because that's so crucial, as you mentioned, so that you're not squandering the opportunity, you're actually maximizing the time together. And I think the other piece that you touched on 
you know, when you're sitting with other real estate agents and you're willing to show taxes and, you know, to, to be transparent is actually mo modeling the vulnerability too. So that's one way, you know, that I, I allow people to, to be vulnerable and I create that vulnerability in them is that I model that vulnerability in myself. So once they realize that I have no, no, you know, no cage up between us and that there's no guard to what I'm sharing, they themselves feel more comfortable sharing with me. And then it becomes a co-creation. Well, you may have messed up my next question because you talked about confidentiality, um, you know, and, and sharing things online. Uh, but so what about like, let's just say a problem, right? You've had a problem. You have a problem with the client. Think of one problem you've had that you've helped one of your clients overcome. So we can try and obviously share with the viewers here, uh, maybe something they can connect with as a problem. Yeah. They've had. Yeah. No, uh I've gotten very good at, 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 at being able to share success stories. I can change, I can change names and genders and times of, you know, times and locations. But I think one, one jumps out to me um, as I think about it, where this was a, an incredibly talented leader who was very much a tactical leader. So very involved in the day-to-day, -day, in the operations of the organization, very hands-on, very in the weeds and wanted to explore ways in which he could transition into being a more strategic leader, a much more visionary leader. So not so in the weeds, learning how to delegate, learning how to trust his team, learning how to communicate effectively, learning how to be explicit with instructions so that things were being accomplished to his standards, but he didn't have to be involved in the day-to-day. -day. And that, that transition, I mean, I get chills just thinking about it because not only did it shape him as a leader, his personal life has improved. His relationships outside of work have improved. His ability to travel and enjoy his life and the balance that he's that he's created. I don't even use the word balance anymore, work-life balance, but the harmony that he's created between his life and his work is such that now he doesn't feel like he's in the weeds constantly. He's still very much a leader. He's modeling good leadership. He's available to his team at all times, but he's Lot, a lot less tactical and now much more strategic and visionary. So that was a great example. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, all right. So let's talk. So I do a lot of like, I, I know you do a different program. Uh, I, I do like the disc training. We talked about it on a couple of mm -hmm. podcasts. Um, I, I think you used a, a different measurement. Uh, but let's talk about like characteristics of, of the uh, executive that is going to hire you, whether it's an agent. Like what what is a... What would be a common characteristic of, of people that you're coaching? Yeah, so I think it's this this commitment to lifelong learning, Kevin. You know, I, I know I know you're very much committed to that. I'm certainly very much committed to that. But it's the lifelong learner. It does not always have to be someone who is, you know, gobbling down per, personal development and self-improvement books and knows, you know, spitting off this author and that author and you know this approach and that approach i don't need to know your mbti letters or your disc disc you know uh, assessment results but i i do i do look for those people who are very much committed to learning and development and growth and if they recognize that they're at a place where they have kind of plateaued or they are just someone who's constantly hungry to be challenged and to to explore new areas for expansion as a leader, coaching is so perfect for them. I mean, I just got done with the client. We did a 360 uh, review, which is, as, as many may know, it's the sort of review, review process for leaders where they're reviewed from everybody in their organization up, down, you know, around, where the results come in and it's a, an evaluation that, that pairs your view of yourself against the views of you by your your you know organizational employees, direct reports, peers, et cetera. And that is an incredibly eye-opening process. And an individual who's not open and receptive to getting that very honest, um, you know, often often eye-opening feedback is gonna really struggle to go through that process and take away, you know, from that the value that they could get from it. So I think it's the person who's really committed to learning. Um, as I think about like sort of Maslow's hierarchy of, need, of, of needs, it's it's this this top the, the 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 top of the sort of triangle is this self actualization spot, 
And that self-actualization spot, people think the goal is to get to the top. And once you reach the top, okay, you wash your hands, you're done. But actually, once you reach there, it's, it's kind of a mountain with no top. It is, it is the place you aspire to get to so that you can continue to work on developing and better, bettering and growing yourself. So I think those people, those clients are the ones who get the most from coaching, surely. Thank you for sharing that. All right. So I call you. I pick up the phone. I call you because I saw this podcast. What's the first question you ask me? I like I like going positive. I'm a I'm a pretty positive guy. So if someone's calling me and they're saying, "Hey, I want to talk to you. What can what can we what can I explore coaching with you?" I always ask them, "What's your what's your what's your big crazy dream? What's your goal?" You know, because I don't want to assume people are calling with challenges. And and undoubtedly, someone who shares a an exciting goal is going to reveal in that they have a goal, but there's a struggle, there's a there's a blockage, there's a limiting belief, and we'll get to that. But I want to really get people present to the positive part of, of coaching. I don't want people feeling like they're going to come into coaching and they're going to have to reveal their souls and that we're going to be peeling back layers aggressively. This is about getting people to that next level, getting people to to accomplish what it is that they really dream about, what they would love to create. Um, so that's one of the first questions I ask is, you know, what, tell me, tell me what your, what your new next exciting goal is. Awesome. I, I'm a big believer in creating, I don't actually do the vision board itself on, on the wall, um, but I have the visions of things that I want to do and where I want to be. And, and part of when I created my first business plan uh, many, many years ago, obviously we're celebrating our, our 20th anniversary. And one of the things that we created was like, where do we want to be in one month? Where do we want to be in three months, six months, 12 months, three years, five years down the road? So we look yeah. at some of these goals. And, and I remember originally um, one of my mentors, one of my first mentors, you know, asked me where I wanted to be. And I told her, um, like, I'm happy where I'm at. And she's like, well, then you're not for me. Like I, mm -hmm. I was, she was a real estate agent. I was the title guy. And she's like, I want to work with someone who thinks bigger. I mean, I was a kid. I was 26 yeah. years old. Um, I didn't really understand goal setting and visions. Uh, so it's great to hear, you know, and uh, off the cuff, a question of like, what do I ask and and, and what do they respond? Um, let's talk about communication because you talked about the key is to effective communication. You mentioned that. Uh, what about if you have an executive there, they have people under them, they have people above them. What, what, how do you help them with effective communication? Like, how do you help them deliver their message better? You know, I'm used to going, you know, you go to Toastmasters and you learn about the ahs and the ums and you learn to talk slower about how to communicate. But the thing is, there's so much more than just being able to articulate your message properly. There has to be keys to where I can communicate my message better to my team. Maybe it's different team to the owner of the company if you're stuck in the middle. So talk a little, just a little bit about communication and skills, maybe techniques you have to to refine the communication skills. Yeah, it's a it's a great question and it's so important, especially once you reach reach a certain level professionally and you're expected to communicate vision and you're supposed to influence and inspire people. I mean, how do you use language to do that? And I think it is a skill. It is something that you have to develop over time. And you know, my. Two of my three C's, my, you know, I, I talk about leading, leading, leading professionals to effectively lead themselves and others with clarity, confidence, and compassion. Those first two, clarity and confidence, are essential for good communication. So if, if, if an individual isn't clear on the message they're trying to communicate, it's never going to come out clearly to, other, to others. And I think that's what I often find is when I'm speaking with a client, I'm saying, okay, so talk to me about what you're trying to communicate. I don't care how broken or choppy it might sound. Talk to me about how what you're trying to communicate. And if they're umming and nodding because they're not really sure what it is they're trying to communicate, right there we, we recognize the problem. Okay, there's no way you're going to walk into, into a, a staff meeting or into a boardroom and have a conversation or present effectively if you aren't clear exactly what you're trying to accomplish and what you're trying to communicate. So clarity is key, absolutely. The other one is confidence. And the confidence often comes from having that clarity first. Once you've got that clarity, you understand what your purpose is, what you understand, what you understand, what you're trying to communicate. Now you can start to create this confidence. Why am I here? Why am I the one presenting this? And sort of eliminating some of these. You know, there's a lot of negative self-talk that we that we find ourselves doing that we have to kind of push away and and eliminate so that we can get through that 
and we can we can adapt this sort of clarity piece, combine it with the confidence we now have that we're the person who should be communicating this. We're in this position for a reason. I'm clear on my message, and then we sort of deliver it effectively. The other piece, Kevin, is being very selective about language. And that comes from emotional intelligence, emotional intelligence, it comes from self-awareness, and it comes from, from sort of approaching our roles as leaders from a place of compassion. So how am I thinking about the, how, how my words land? Am I, am, I, am I receptive to how the, you know, the audience in the room that I'm speaking to is going to feel about the way in which I'm presenting this information? And people who lack that self-awareness or that depth in the emotional intelligence, they're just coming out there, they're presenting information, they don't care how it lands, and then they get upset when it doesn't land the way they hoped it would. So I think those three are really, really important. It's the clarity, it's the confidence, and then it's really about having a, you know, sort of a complex skill set around uh, self-awareness and emotional intelligence that, that has a message land. Amazing stuff. Uh, so let's say I'm, I'm clear, right? I'm cl I have the clarity on, on what mm -hmm. I'm doing. My communication is much better because I've coached with you. Um, I got to have some blind spots, right? There's got to be things that I don't know about myself, right? Because a blind spot means, you know, maybe I don't know it's there. Um, yeah. What do you think? Like, what, what are some of the things you're seeing with people where you have to kind of hold them accountable to be like, well, you know this. Like I was talking with one of my friends who is a uh, property manager and, and we were talking about like how you're a workaholic and you're constantly working. Like you don't see that what you're doing is not healthy for you yeah. because you think you're doing what the boss wants you to do. You're trying to yeah. just stay ahead as opposed to trying to figure out why you're doing it. And it's eye opening when I sit with some of my, my friends and people I mentor with and yeah. executives, it's like, and, and myself included, you know, sure. sometimes you hear things and you're like, wow, I didn't really realize that about myself. Um, sometimes I post something online and I just post it real quick and someone messages me and they're like, yeah, maybe that's not the best thing for you to post because it's yeah. interpreted by someone I'll like you see it. It's like a crystal ball. You know, you see it a little bit differently than I do. So think, oh, can you think of like maybe a blind spot or two that that clients have? Uh, again, common theme across, you know, entrepreneurs that, that are watching this that will be like, wow, I do that as well. Yeah, absolutely. So I think one of the most powerful pieces about coaching, and I talked to this, I talked to my clients about this, and I talk about this on, on the other podcast, is that as a, as a coach, I get to serve as a mirror to my clients. So, I mean, there are many instances, Kevin, where like, someone will say something to me and then I'll say, pause right there. I want to repeat back to you verbatim what you just said to me and you give me your reaction. And I'll say back exactly what they just said to me. Say, for example, they said that I was talking to a direct report and I said this, Hakeem, what does that sound like? And I'll say, before I comment on that, let me repeat back to you what you just said to me. And they, I mean, I watch their facial, their facial expression and their, and their sort of nonverbal reaction to it. And I say, what do you, what did that make you feel like? How did, how did that sound to you? And they're like, well, that's not what I said. I said, verbatim, verbatim what you said. And look at your reaction. You don't even realize that you would have a similar reaction that your direct report had hearing your, your, you know, off the cuff comment in that way. So, so I think I get to serve as a mirror to my clients and that I'm constantly referring back to them what they're sharing with me, which 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 forces them to be accountable for their, their their communication, their language. The other blind spot that I see a lot of, Kevin, is feedback. People really, really struggle with receiving feedback. And the nice part about coaching is that this is a safe place. There's nobody judging you here. I'm here to give you feedback. That that's why you hired me. I'm here to give you observations and 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 suggestions and ideas and powerful questions that cause you to sort of question and challenge this way of thinking that you had for so long if you're not receptive to that feedback is going to be i mean it's going to be your downfall as a leader because that's where the growth occurs so in an organization when you're someone who is adamantly opposed to feedback or you don't even know that you're opposed to feedback but you just sort of give off this vibe that you aren't receptive to it, 
people start looking at you differently. They start to interact with you differently, and they they look at you as less susceptible to to growth and and, and improvement and modification of your approach because you don't receive feedback well. The other one I was going to say too, and you gave a perfect example of it, the, some, the one who was talking about like, you know, this, this, this healthy work-life balance. I had a client, we did a 360 review, rave reviews from his direct reports. They just said, wow, you know, we love, we love this guy. He's fantastic. Um, but one, one item of feedback that we have is that he never takes vacation. And he doesn't even take sick days when he's sick. He's always in the office. And I asked the question, well, does he encourage you to do the same? And they said, yes, of course. You know, they, they, he encourages us to take vacation. He encourages us to take sick time when we need it. But he never does. So, so by default, he's modeling to us that it may not be acceptable to take the time. Even though he's telling us to, we still are hesitant to take vacation time or sick time when we need to. And when I shared that with my client, that was such a blind spot for him that he's forever changed after that conversation. Interesting. You know, my, one of my mentors, Bob Berg, and I know I've talked to you about him. Mm -hmm. uh, he wrote the law, the, the go-giver, the book, the go-giver. It talks about the five laws of stratospheric success. And one of them is the law of receptivity that says the key to effective giving is to stay open to receiving. And I interpret that as receiving good, bad, and everything in between. So being open to receiving advice and know that that is the key to building an effective giving business. Like the more I give yeah. and the more I'm open to receiving, the better my business is going to be. So you have to be open to receiving feedback. You have to be open to receiving gifts from people. You have mm -hmm. to be open to receiving compliments from people. And it's interesting when you start talking about the, the act of listening and being able to repeat, uh, I feel like this is a therapy session because if you ask my wife, that's exactly what she would tell you. It's like she can repeat verbatim what I say. And I'm like, I didn't say that. Yeah. So yeah. who was right? Who was wrong? More than likely, I was wrong. I just don't admit it. Hopefully she doesn't <laughs> watch my podcast. I don't know if she does. Or doesn't. <laughs> hopefully she doesn't watch my podcast. If she does, hopefully she doesn't watch, you know, 35 minutes into it uh, to know that I said that. But I mean, that's the reality, right? You're, if you're yeah. not open to receiving you're not going to grow. You're not, yeah. and, and you and I are in some some uh, a high level, you know, the brotherhood um, where sometimes we go deep and sometimes we talk about things that we may not want to hear the feedback and we may not want to to tell others, but we do it anyway because it sucks and yeah. and you know it's just what we do. So I think it's great. Um, yeah. All right, let's talk about so so now that we're in a little bit of of an economic. Um, we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know what's going on, good or bad. Yeah. But we know people are tightening up right now. So let's say I'm the business owner and I just don't have the money uh, to invest in, in coaching. But like, why should I? What What's the important part? Regardless, I guess, whether it's a business owner or if, let's just say it's a real estate agent. And they're yeah. like, I don't have the money to invest in coaching. Why should I do it? Like, what would you help me with in order to coach under you? Yeah. I mean, I think I think what, even when I'm in the in the money conversation, which, you know, sort of undoubtedly comes up when you're talking to people about investing in themselves at a certain level. It's a high it's a high fee because I value people at that level. I value my coaching at that level. I value my clients at that level. And when we're having that money conversation, I always say, look, coaching's already begun. The coaching has already begun because as you think about how you value yourself, how you value your success and the future that you're trying to build. Are you looking for a coach that's five hundred dollars? Are you looking for a coach that's five thousand dollars? You know, I mean, there's there's a sort of premium product mentality here too, but also it's not on the product, it's on yourself. And I think a lot of clients, once they realize, okay, I could go out there and invest in a boot camp or a certificate program at the local college or university i could go get an advanced degree in higher ed you know i've i've worked in higher ed for for many years higher ed is changing we know higher ed is changing um and as we think about where we want to invest our time what better place than to invest it in our own leadership in our own self-leadership to cre to create an understanding of ourselves that is going to is going to give back year over year over year over year i mean this is an investment not for this particular you know time in which you're being coached 
but it's for all of the years going forward. So I think when when people think about coaching, yes, some people come in because they have an immediate need. Okay, I've taken on a new leadership role and I've got a, a challenging direct report. Can you help me navigate this uh, difficult situation? Of course. But through that, the learning and the understanding and the unpacking that we do uh, through coaching is 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 the type of work that ends up paying dividends over time. And I think that when you can when you can see the investment as as that an investment not only in yourself but in your your earning potential in your relationships in your your mental and physical health in your you know business business growth you realize that it's it's actually you know small dollars compared to what you can create from it i will say however though that when you think about these ever-changing times and how people are thinking about money, I think it's also important to shop around. I think it's really important to explore what's out there and to explore different types of coaches. I mean, I've got people who come to me who we have a great conversation and we determine it's not the right fit because they're looking for something else. Or, you know, the type of coaching I do isn't really, isn't really well suited for what they're trying to accomplish. And that's okay. But I think that Rather than rushing into something, you know, a bit rash, I think that it's a good idea for people to take the time to explore, have conversations, and then really fine tune what they're trying to accomplish. Because then spending that money isn't a, isn't a hard decision at all. It ends up being quite easy. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I appreciate you you taking your your valuable time to be with us. I like to keep exactly. these to 45 minutes. So if you don't mind, I'll ask one more question yeah. uh, and then we'll wrap it up. Let's talk about trends of what you're seeing as far as people hiring coaches. Uh, I'm sure you see different corporations maybe that, that are a little bit tighter in money. Um, what are you seeing out there as far as people that are investing in, in uh, different types of coaching? So I think what I'm seeing is uh, a, certainly an increase in companies investing. So for a long time, there were individuals who would go out and they had the resources and they would invest. Now I'm starting to see companies really offer this as a benefit. So you can think about things like better help for mental health and gym memberships. And, you know, of course the, the traditional health benefits and retirement plans, this is now being offered. I mean, especially as the workforce evolves and employees needs and desires and generational, you know, shifts occur, they're saying we recognize the increased value that coaching has for our employees we are going to offer you X number of hours with a coach, or we're going to end, we're going to offer you X number of dollars per fiscal year to dedicate towards professional development or, you know, personal development or, you know, leadership training, whatever it might be. So I'm starting to see that as a trend. Um, and, and that has really sort of been folded into this well-being movement. So when you think about, you know, sort of professional well-being, it's been mostly around this sort of mental health, mental fitness, making sure that people are, you know, keeping themselves healthy mentally. But I think that one of the things that really that, that, that really plagues professionals is an inability to navigate some of the challenges that just sort of naturally come up in the workplace in an effective way. And that's because they they lack some of the self-awareness, they lack some of the skills in terms of communication or empathy or emotional intelligence that are required to handle themselves effectively in these you know various situations so when an employer can say look we want to give you this off you know this opportunity to work with a coach to develop this they're not only improving that individual employee but they're really they're really speaking to what the culture is of the organization and they're then supporting a much more functional much more collaborative much more communicative um workforce in in, in their organization Awesome. Thank you. Well, clearly you're passionate about coaching. Clearly I'm passionate about coaching. Hopefully the viewers found some value in today's show. So I appreciate you coming on. How can they get a hold of you uh, if they want to reach you? Yeah. Thanks so much for having me too, Kevin. I appreciate it. Um, you can reach out to me anytime. Hakeem, H-A-K-I-M at Lockstar Coaching. That's L-A-K-H-D-A-R coaching.com. Um, you can call me anytime direct to it's 850 322 8109. I'm happy to set up a time for us to talk and have a conversation and see what's from there. Awesome. Well, I encourage everyone listening to this. I'll put Hakeem's contact information in the description. Uh, give us a like, give us a share if you found value in this. 
I encourage you all, if you're in business, you're thinking about maybe as a coach for me, reach out to Hakeem, schedule a, a time to just have a little chat with him, have uh, a cup of coffee or a Zoom call with him and just get to know him and see if coaching may be for you. I know it's for me. I do it on many levels. I have many coaches and mentors over the years, and there's so much value in, in personal and professional development. Uh, you know, we're celebrating our 20th year in business, and I tell people five years just to become an entrepreneur. It takes many more years than that to learn the skill set you need to truly be successful. Whether you're a solopreneur, an entrepreneur, an intrapreneur, it doesn't matter. Personal and professional development is not cheap, but it takes you to a whole nother level. So if you want to scale your business from 10,000 to 100,000, 100,000 to a million, million to 10 million, you need a coach. You need someone to teach you those failures in life. I guarantee it. I've used it in my business. So I'm speaking from experience. So I encourage you to reach out to Hakeem today. Thanks for joining us on the show today, Hakeem. We appreciate you. Glad to be here. Thank you. For everyone else, we look forward to seeing you on another episode of the Real Estate Podcast. Give us a like, follow, and share on social media. And as always, Kevin Thatcher, the founder and CEO here at Independence Title. That's right. Chief Everything Officer signing off. I look forward to seeing you soon at the closing table. Bye-bye.